Hey, I'm Nick DiMatteo and welcome to the very special first patron edition of Music Is Everything. If you are watching this, it is because you are a patron on my Patreon page, patreon.com slash music is not a genre, and I thank you very much for that. Unless I have released this for some special reason, then that's a whole different story. Uh, but uh, but, uh, but uh, thank you and welcome, and of course this is the first of many. Uh, of my podcast, Music is Everything. Uh, I take a musical idea, thought, feeling, philosophy, opinion, fact. I talk about it at length, uh, verbatim from the pages, and then I discuss it extemporaneously in hopes that you will join in and let me know what you think. Connect that music idea to things in real life. Um, again, thank you for being a patron. Thank you for following me at all. I appreciate you being present, period, and for the, your contribution and, and everything helps. And uh, if you think you know somebody else who might like what I do, is a music obsessive, likes hearing talk about music, etc., uh, how music connects to life, please send this to them. I want to grow the family for so many reasons in so many ways. Um, this week is not is special not just because this is the first pa patron episode. Uh, it's also because, uh, as you can see, I'm, I'm a little scaled down here. I don't have my big screen. I'm going to be using my notes, etc. I've done that before, so you know. Uh, it's because uh, we are in the process of relaunching our t-shirt company, Snurk Shirts by Feet. And you're going to get more information on that as soon as it's launched. Uh, here's an example of what you will be seeing and getting is this here. Here's our, one of our standard t-shirts, our signature tee, the ah tee. And we'll be adding more products and things like that and ways that you can uh, buy and save and all that stuff. And so that has scaled down this area, creating, there's a phot photography studio set up right over here where we're taking photos of the new shirts and stuff like that. Um, so that's why this is what it is. So enough about the intro, let's get to this week's topic. And it's a timely topic, as if you're watching this, uh, around when I recorded it in November 2020, you know that we just had an election. If not, ah, oh, nostalgia, remember 2020, what a wonderful year it was. <laughs> and uh, you'll see how this ties into this particular period in history, really any period, but this one in, in particular. Uh, the topic this week is the democratization of music why trends no longer matter. Since the beginning of popular music, and depending on how you define it, that could mean hundreds of years ago, trends have been a thing. Whether due to music creators pushing through to the next or different level of composition, performance and production, or fans being attracted by something new and different and or wanting to jump on the latest bandwagon, or the powers that be, patrons, companies, journalists, critics, deciding what should be hot or seeing what sells best. What's been constant is that new styles and ideas of music replace the old. A sound or style that was hot for a while can become cliche or passe, pushing out the old style to near extinction. It can happen subtly over a few years or overnight in a blink. At first, modern media and the internet sped up this turnover process, like it sped up everything. Then, about 10 to 15 years ago, right around when streaming took over as the dominant way to absorb music, the whole thing reached an infinity point and exploded. Trends started running into each other, overlapping, repeating, dying and regenerating, appearing and disappearing, too quickly to take hold and push out anything else. In short, trends in music up and died. When I was starting out in music, and for decades before and a little after, trends were so dominant that you had to be super plugged in to make sure you didn't fall behind, or worse, get too far ahead. It put a whole other level of pressure on everyone, creators, fans, sellers, chroniclers. You couldn't just do or like any old thing. You had to keep track of what was currently hot, still hot but fading, totally gone, gone but retro cool again, up and coming, completely off the chart, or any number of other classifications. It was exhausting and suffocating and produced tremendous anxiety. And once you're on that track, it's really hard to jump off. You get addicted to believing that it's the only way to be relevant and succeed. 
and you're afraid that if you hop off the track, you'll immediately be done for. So when that infinity point explosion happened, I didn't notice at first. Then I sensed something was different. And once I became aware, it slowly hit me that it was all over. And it felt fucking great, liberating. I started hearing out of time production values, sounds, effects, ways of writing, singing, performing that didn't fit into the trending pop landscape. This was initially just an indie music. Lesser known acts out of the mainstream. So I didn't think much of it. I figured it was creatives in their sandboxes building retro castles. Slowly, but really not that slowly, these sounds started showing up on the charts. First as novelties, and then as mini trends. At some point, these mini trends bubbled up, overlapped, intertwined, and burned off so rapidly that trying to call any one of them the new trend was pointless. This set off a wave of creation with little to no boundary. People were doing whatever they wanted as if it was all okay, because all of a sudden it was. Songs could sound like they were made in any recent decade, and as long as they were good, they were accepted. Now, there are certainly still trends or movements in all areas of music in the sense that creatives, producers, writers, performers, always have ears to the ground listening for awesome ideas to adapt. The difference is these are not ruling taste or ruling what's allowed to be heard. They're just there. There are also still people who need trends. If you look hard enough, you'll find some article or post somewhere that tries to push a trend, and inevitably some people will latch onto that as the truth. It's a security blanket, an easy way to feel plugged into and a part of something. If you can say this type of music is hotter than that old other type of music. But at this point, it takes more effort to be that restrictive and exclusionary than it does to just open up and accept that it's all okay. I'm gonna repeat that. It takes more effort to be that restrictive and exclusionary than it does to just open up and accept that it's all okay. We all know people who seem either very determinedly rigid or always wary and uncomfortable. Whether it's about proximity, acceptance, or even just the mere mention, these people bristle at otherness. They resist human connection. They resist seeing how much they have in common with those others. They create boxes and put themselves and their perceived kind in one and everyone else in the other. At best, it just lets them feel safer and more secure in who they are and keeps whatever danger they feel exists at bay. At worst, it gives them a reason to demonize, discriminate, blame, and put a host of negatives in that other box to justify their prejudice. That shit takes a lot of energy. Like how a frown is way harder to make than a smile. It takes work. It takes a constant vigilance of potential threats and infiltrations from all sources, in real life or online. It takes constant self-monitoring to make sure you're not slipping free from the self-constraints. Above all, it takes a constant self-delusion to deny reality the truth and the overwhelming consensus that the trendiness of whitehood died out a long time ago. It's now just one of dozens, hundreds, thousands, millions of strains of what we are and can be. So let's all try to stop seeing boxes that don't exist, trends that have no hold. Let's turn that existential frown upside down and learn to accept that all of it and all of us are all okay. You don't know this unless I've decided to share it, but this is the second time I'm doing this podcast and uh, another podcast on my YouTube channel because I accidentally hit slow-mo when I hit the first one. 
And what was initially, you know, 20 some minutes was like an hour and 20 some minutes uh, in very slow motion. It'll be fun to play with that. But having done it a second time, there are a couple things that have happened. One is, um, I, you know, it was a little easier for me to read this because I actually, you know, practiced it, right, once or twice. But the second thing is, it really kind of called up some, you know, emotional responses that are driving me to get into my normal second part of this podcast. And that's one of the main reasons, uh, you know, or two reasons why I decided early on to start splitting this podcast into two parts was because, you know, hey, that first part, it's wonderful, right? You know, but it's a little antiseptic. And if you stop there, you're not fostering conversation, whether it's conversation with myself, with the camera, with you, and, and all that back and forth. It doesn't have that spontaneous feel that you need to really let ideas bubble over, you know, and, uh, and be shared. And the second thing is when I, when I read these things, uh, I often feel and think things that I hadn't when I, when I was writing them. You know, and I mean, I write with passion and all of that, but the reading, the bringing it out, you know, creates, it creates more passion. There's a song of mine uh, called Sing Out on my band Rex's new EP, uh, Syncope for the Weird, now on Spotify and elsewhere. And uh, it, it, one of the lines is, it's like, I don't know what I'm thinking till I say it out loud. And I think it's a very common thing for all of us. Uh, you know, conversation therapy or whatever you want to call it, whether it's with a friend or a loved one or a therapist or yourself, the act of speaking, the act of saying things out loud can help to flesh out ideas and, and thoughts and feelings that were, you know, unformed or that you didn't even know you had. And when I read this the first aborted time and the second time here, it really, you know, the reason why I uh, repeated a line is because there are certain things that are really hitting me more strongly, right? And the line I repeated, um, before I get into the whole music part of this, is that line, it takes more effort to be restrictive and exclusionary than it does just open up and accept that it's all okay, right? Now, let's put it all together. Let's put it all together. So, you know, um, musically, yes, as I said, the people who are kind of wary and uncomfortable, there is a safety in sticking to what you know. That's like home to you, and hey, I get that, right? And there are people who only like to be at home. And I don't mean just for this pandemic, I mean always. Um, that's their safe space. Being outside is not a great thing for them, right? Or if they have to go outside for many different reasons, they do it and somehow bring that home with them. And look, we all do that. But I'm saying there are people who go the, uh, you know, uh, 11th mile or whatever new phrase I'm making up this week. And, and, you know, I mean, that's fine to one degree. But I think there's a bit of a repression and a self-repression there that is cutting off a lot of the rest of experience of life, right? More than that, though, and especially with the people who are determinedly rigid, as I said, who kind of have that, they're basing, you know, they're allowing that fear to morph into anger to become this kind of lockbox that keeps the things they believe inside and puts everything else out there, it, it, is that that's a lot that, that, like I said, that takes a lot of energy. It takes a lot of effort. It takes actually a lot of thought, even, and a lot of, certainly a lot of emotion. Um, you know, physics says that there's a finite amount of energy in the universe, right? And even though I believe that human, uh, philosophical, existential, spiritual energy uh, is not finite in the, you know, infinity sense, in the, sen in the infinity sense, in the sense of the entire history and, you know, the universe, past, present, future, we as humans do have a finite amount of energy because there's this thing called death. And to expend so much of that energy in creating these boxes and creating these prejudices and to, to not just create them, but to hold them up constantly against the overwhelming truth that, that they are just not real, it's a, it's a lot of wasted energy. It's a, it's a thing that kind of makes me sad at times, annoys me and angers me, frankly. And I, you know, one of the reasons why I did this po started this podcast is because I found that I have such a passion for music and a knowledge of music 
that the things I believed in music were very, very similar to or, or equal to or the same as things I believe about the rest of the world, you know. So I would start using in casual conversation, you know, um, ar you know arguments like, well, if you're the kind of person who hears that someone else likes a band that you don't like, then you are automatically judge them in a certain way, let's say. Or vice versa, if you say you love this certain band or artist and the person you're talking to is like, ew, why? Then you feel uh, hurt and offended and all of that. And I'm saying this because I did all of that. I did all of it, all of it, you know? Um, I, you know, I, I think that that's something that can be easily applied to the rest of life. It makes perfect sense, you know? somebody comes up to you and they are, uh, you know, saying beliefs and things uh, about the world that you disagree with, you might automatically say, well, I can't get along with you at all. There's nothing in common. I'm going to just shut you out. Uh, or the same vice versa. You tell your per somebody a belief and they kind of pause and be like, no, you know, and, and then there's a disconnect there. Um, it's a shame and it's sad and it's because we don't realize most of the time the boxes that we create for ourselves and that again it takes a lot of effort and it, and it takes effort and energy from all sides you know all sides it's not just people who are considered to be reactionary or restrictive or conservative um, liberals and moderates and all of us do the same thing you know you have to believe what I believe, or you're not a true American, or you're not a true humanist, or whatever it is, you know, or you're not, whatever label, which, and you know, I'm not a fan of labels, you want to put, you find a way to say, well, if you don't align with what I align with, then screw you, you know, and that's, and, and we can't be, you know, hypocritical about that. We all are, and, and you know, at least on the inside, um, and many of us on the outside too, at times. But I think it, it's worth the effort to be aware of that and to try to fight against it and to, and to say to ourselves, well, wait a second, if I believe that all people should be accepted and equal the way all music should be accepted and equal, then I can't demonize a group because I think that, they're, they, that they disagree with me, you know, other than in action. To me, when it, when it gets into action, when something you believe is somehow actively affecting someone else's life, whether it's through physical action or legislation or money or something, that's where I draw the line. I don't, I, you know, where you are restricting someone else's life because of things you believe or harming them in some way. But if it's a belief, if it's just something you hold inside of you and your actions are not really following through with then, no, I don't agree with it at all. But I believe that there is common ground. You know, and that common ground can often be that kind of nudge from something familiar to something unfamiliar that has this little connection, and it's tra it's important to kind of I think try to find those connections. You know, and and so you know the the way I connected this to the idea of trends in music is that you know we come from a time when popular music blew up from the nineteen teens and twenties through ten years ago. And through that process, 10, 20 years ago, the, you know, the boxes that we put music in got, got more varied and smaller and smaller and smaller until, you know, no, music is not a genre, but just for want of a better word, you know, we had sub, 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 sub genres of every genre, you know, like, which look, that just proves, uh, like this book I'm reading, Why You Like It, um, it says that it's a tricky business, you know, to, to try to label something because there are very few songs that fall into one strict label, which is why I keep saying music is not a genre. Well, guess what? There are very few people who fall into one strict label. There are very few groups of people who fall into one strict label. You know, I sometimes get shocked when I, a person from a certain demographic group feels about something in a certain way or votes in a certain way. That's on me. That's not on them. That's on me for for thinking that because they're in a certain group, they have to or should, you know, or must believe or feel in one way about something. Um, it's, it's, it's hard to do that in life because we get scared of that sense of other. We feel like it's going to threaten us somehow, which let me tell you, it doesn't. Not nothing. Nothing about that ever threatens. 
again, short of actually taking action, you know, on threatening somebody. But the, the, the existence of that other thing, is what I'm saying, does not threaten our existence, right? Just as um, opening up to the idea that another type of music that is foreign to us feels like it might threaten our idea of what good music is, it doesn't. It really doesn't. And, uh, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to go on too super long here, but because I have my notes, I'm going to, you know, pick a couple of things off of these. And just to get back to the music real quick, I started noticing, uh, the kind of retro that I was into when bands like Block Party or producers like the Neptunes, you know, were really kicking off. Uh, and even in some ways like the Strokes and the White Stripes, so early O's, right? And again, I thought, oh, cool and whatever. But as that decade progressed through the O's and into the early teens, it really did start to be like all of this stuff was coexisting. And I do credit that to the internet. And I credit that the people being able to make decisions that go beyond that small filter of what you know got on the radio back when the radio was the big thing, or what was sold on a CD, or a, you know, or a, an album or cassette, or any of that stuff. When streaming happened, when really when YouTube uh, happened as well, um, people got to decide what was good or bad based on what they liked or didn't like. And what we found out, both as fans and musicians and as the industry, is that it didn't matter how this stuff sounded in terms of era or production style or any of that stuff. If a song was good, a song was good. It's a song that I just um, quoted, Sing Out, the song that I just released. Um, I was unsure of it at first, because you, you're always questioning, you know, as artists do that. And then I heard a commercial, and it sounded so much production-wise like that song, I was like, what am I worried about? Because it's true, and it is hard to get out of that notion, that feeling, that repression of feeling like you have to follow a trend and be locked into it, and in one step ahead even, just, just one step though, not two or three, or your career will fail. That was just horrible feeling for so long, so long. And it comes back, you know, you, it, you know those kind of things, they, they get triggered um, because you, you live with something for so long. And I just had to be reminded that that that's not the case anymore. And and no, in some ways it never was the case because you make what you make. But really, let's you know be realistic. The kind of stuff that got played and sold and 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 popularized by the machine, especially, uh, had to be of a certain type of music and a certain done in a certain way, production wise and writing wise, or it never went anywhere. That is so not the case now. It's why the industry is still really, in many ways, scrambling. They don't know what to do with all this diversity, and I think they're doing a real shit job of it, but yeah, some smaller companies are doing a better job. Um, you know, so that was just a real release. It was very, was liberating, like I said, you know? And my, my hope is that that's something, I don't think that will ever change, because I, you know, now that the you know, internet is here and globalism is, is just running you know, rampant in a very good way, I think, uh, it's not something that we can turn back the clock on. And because we've lived with it for so long, from back even, and I mean even before this, but a good example is uh, music that was from the Baroque period, uh, was all of a sudden, you know, or Rococo was considered too fancy, too frilly. That's why you can use those terms outside of music. Like that's a very, you know, Rococo uh, in terms of architecture, Baroque and things like that. That's just too intricate and fancy and interweaving because classical kind of opened it up in a different way and created more emotion. And the Romanticism may, gave it even more emotion and beyond and beyond uh, to modernism, postmodernism and, and, and through all of that. You see these things happening in music, which I think on a musical you know, level is just fucking awesome. But on the level of, you know, trends, again, it's restrictive. You know, what if somebody like, you know, Bach was continuing to write like Bach, but classicism came out and said, now that sounds old hat, which it did happen. Frankly, it did happen. Then that person was kind of out of a job. And that was a period thing that happened over decades back then, which then as, you know, society sped up and in the 20th century, it would be maybe a decade or eventually, you know, or 20 years or a decade or half a decade or just a few years or even less. And that's why it hit that infinity point and that explosion. And I think it's important to state we're not in that anymore. We are truly now in the postmodern era, something we've been talking about for decades. This is what, this is the fruition 
even just to the beginning of the fruition of all that stuff that we were talking about. And it, it starts with inclusion. It starts with everything is all okay and everyone is all okay. Uh, so thank you for listening to that. And uh, I would love to know what you think about all of this, uh, whether you agree or disagree, love or hate everything I'm saying or a part of what I'm saying, or if you have other examples, if you think I mucked up something or uh, re really agree with something and want to add to that, there's some other band or, or era or type of production you want to throw in there, some other societal thing that you think applies, please let me know because my objectives, as always, are music, conversation, and connection. Thank you for listening for watching, for reading, for clicking, for sharing what you can share, for being a patron, and I'll see you next time.